thank you all for coming. In the, a uh, broad strokes uh, course like this, there's always going to be a fundamentals. Uh, and I always want to make this the essentials of what everybody knows already. So this is more of a senior resident and fellows course. So anybody here never, can you show by hands who has done one thoracolumbar spine trauma with pedicle screws, osteotomies, anybody who has not done one before? Perfect, okay. So another plus is that anytime I talk about uh, thoracolumbar trauma, the telex comes up, and I'm always fortunate to have always one member of the whole telex uh, consortium here so they can interject very well. And today, that person's gonna be Dr. Harrop because he is part of the uh, uh, organizers and also the founders of the telex core. How's that? So if, if we say anything wrong, please uh, interject. <laughs> All right, so objectives will be uh, fracture overview, the classification system uh, overview, this is more of a historical um, overview, and then also non-operative treatment versus operative treatment, and a few case examples. So um, this is still a 15,000 major thoracic lumbar injuries occur per year in the U.S., and about 5,000 of them have neurological deficits. The number seems to be rising, but it's more better capture, uh, I think, than the incidence by itself. And some of the basics that everybody knows about is that um, why is it the most common area? Because the transition area from a mobile uh, um, spine to an immobile spine, um, and also there's transition from kyphosis to lordosis. Uh, there's no universally agreed upon classification. So you have people who you call in the evening or in the morning when there's a trauma, and then they take one look at the film and they say, yeah, it needs to go to your You're like, oh, wait, how did you decide that? But an ideal classification system is supposed to help it's supposed to help uh, cover the vast majority of injuries so people can talk to each other, correspond to the anatomic pathology, determine treatment options, and also determine prognosis if it's good. But the key is that it has to be simple, okay? So, you know, the initial ones would be the three-column model. I urge the Pittsburgh residents not to text me while I'm giving the lecture. You're sitting right there. All right. So, so the, the I, ideal... The ideal uh, uh, model that came out was a three-column model. Anybody kn does not know what this is, I want to skip straight away so people can enjoy their lunch. Okay, great. So everybody knows three-column model is taught in, these days in med school, anterior column, middle column, posterior column. So that was the initial sort of anatomic basis of uh, fracture injury. And typically, you say the anterior column fractures will be stable. Middle column, you start going on shaky grounds, possibly unstable. And then the, if you have a three-column injury, it's unstable. So that's sort of the basis of people looking at imaging and say, that needs to go to the OR. And you, you're, you're waiting for your presentation of your TLIC score, the AO classification, and you're like, wait, 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 we didn't even get there. But literally, it boils down from historically, the anterior column uh, uh, fractures being mostly compression fractures where the ligament is intact, there's, um, there's no canal compromise, two, stable burst fractures um, where there's a, like a two column, there's some angulation, um, but there's no communication of the fractures and no posterior column injury, okay? And then it gets worse and worse to loss of body height and unstable burst, there's spinal cord injury, then there's fraction, uh, like inflection, distraction injuries, um, with posterior ligament disruption, and then there's also dislocation, fracture dislocation. So as it gets more intense uh, with cord damage and multiple uh, anatomic structures being uh, involved, the surgical or uh, incidence of surgery should go high, okay? So there we go. So I used to have this talk over the last 10 years. I've evolved from going through the whole AO classification. Anybody use the AO classification in their program, their own practice? Okay. Where are you from, sir? McGill? Okay, good. So that, 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 that fits. So as, as this um, forum becomes more uh, US-centered uh, versus North American-centered, the AO classification, the only person who gets in it with me is Dr. Chapman. But conveniently, I organized a case for him today. So he's not here. Um, so we, we can. Uh, 
it, I reserve that for another lecture because there is always a modification of the AO classification that we argue on. So this is it. This is uh, Dr. Vicaro and uh, Ed Al. The one of the Ed Al happens to be Jim Harrop, and he's right there. So if I say anything wrong, he's ready to say no. That's not what we we plan it to be like. But it's a. Anybody knows anything about the uh, TLIC score? Good. Anybody does not know the thoracolumbar uh, uh, injury classification and injury uh, severity scale? Anybody? Who does not know th that this scale exists or this score exists? Who does not? Beautiful. We can skip the whole lecture now. This is perfect. All right, so just overview, injury morphology. Um, it's a point system, injury morphology, and also you, you go by well, let's go back, back. Oh, we're going forward actually. So we're going by neurology point system, and then these are the qualifiers. So anybody who knows this, I always say I spend more time with the qualifiers, right? So open fractures, um, you know, these turn non-operative cases to surgical cases and vice versa, right? So people with open fractures, um, you definitely have to take them to the OR, if anything, to prevent sequela of open fractures. Overlying burns, um, they become something that somebody who's not going to tolerate a brace. If, if you've ever seen somebody being braced with burns, um, you can appreciate what happens uh, less than three weeks later. And also, patients who are morbidly obese, that's my uh, practice typically. It's like your injury severity is directly in proportion to how morbidly obese you are, uh, or should I say your propensity to do something uh, injurious to yourself is, is correlated to how morbidly obese you are in my, in my uh, area. And also patients who, are, who have um, disorders of the bone, me metabolic bone disease, DISH, uh, AS. And if somebody has a sternal fracture with a thoracolumbar uh, thoraco spine fracture, I always want you to be careful about not um, turn, if they're literally a TLIC score of four, to consider, consider surgical options for them, okay? That's mostly to do with balance and also pain control. Internal bracing helps. Those who have also multiple traumas and coronal plane deformity. Anybody knows why um, big on stabilizing people with coronal plane deformities with fractures? Think anatomically. Any volunteers? It looks stable. It's a, you know, there's no. Right, it's all about axial loading and also balancing somebody on a on a sheared uh, on a plane that's sheared off. Right, so they're not going to heal properly, and they're going to have propensity of having a horrible uh, fixed uh, deformity. Okay, so and of course age. Right, so if somebody's very old, frail, you you may have to take the opportunity to stabilize them versus thinking that they're going to do well if they meet criteria to go to your OR, okay? And also, you have to consider general health also. If they're too frail to, to, to tolerate a brace, surgery in, in the right setting may be the best option, okay? So, literally, the treatment algorithm, as you all know, is three points or less non-operative uh, injuries with four points equals the non-op versus op, where the qualifiers come into play, and injuries with five points or more involves surgery, okay? So first you, as you all know, you identify the, oh, hold on, there we go. You identify the fracture morphology, you assess the integrity of the PLC, and then you assess the neurological status, okay? This is where the new modification for the uh, AO classification system is trying to address. And then you go to the uh, TLIC score, et cetera, and you provide treatment, okay? so. Simple application. You have a 35-year-old male, fell from a ladder, neuro intact, burst fracture. It's quite obvious, two points. He's neuro intact, so zero points for that. PLC, zero points. Total score, two points, non-operative treatment. Uh, similarly, you have a 38-year-old, another example, belter driver, complete paraplegia. So already you have two points for the uh, burst fracture there. It's pretty obvious, don't need to tell any anybody here in this quorum, and also you have complete injury, so that's four points. The PLC is disrupted. It's best examined, as you know, by MRI, so 
that gets him three points, so seven points operative treatment. This is easy, right? So you look at this and you're like, oh yeah, that needs to go to surgery, right? You don't, you don't need a score for that. But literally, there are avenues where you have to seriously consider both the qualifiers, which I always say, that's your ticket. That's where you need to decide, is this person going to do well or not, right? So why do I like it? It's easy to teach you know, residents and fellows. It's uh, simple. It considers most important decision points. And simply, I love it. I, I, when I was a resident, the AO with uh, classification system was out, 64 points to, to torture me. I didn't think it was a good idea. But now that this is being recorded, I will probably have to pay for it later. They have new qualifiers. Dr. Chapman is not here, so I'm free to say what I want to say about it. So general points regarding classification schemes is to familiarize yourself with the classification system at your institution. Right, McGill uses this, they use also the TLEX. They have two, two ways to get it wrong. And also, no classification is perfect, right? So the surgical approach may be based on other factors such as patient-related issues and the surgeon's preference, right? So bracing sometimes may be an option. And we're gonna go into this, but this is the card that I always implore my PGY2s to have. Um, you know, it's easily online. You just get it, put in your pocket. So when you call somebody late in the evening, you're kind of immediately, before you say anything, I say, who else did you talk to? You talk to the chief, you talk to, okay, great. Then you can start talking about what you think. That's great. Five treatment goals, very simple. Okay, let's keep it simple. What are we trying to do? Somebody has a fracture, other than we're going to do pedicle screws or do a corpectomy and, and stabilize them. We're literally trying to prevent neurological deterioration. We want to pr promote uh, recovery, stabilize the spine. We want to restore an an anatomical alignment and facilitate early and active mobilization. And of course, we want to minimize their pain and deformity, okay? so. TL injury options, compression fractures, brace or no brace for majority. Um, there are plenty of, any, anybody whose program does not brace compression fractures. How many people have split attending? Some do, some don't. See, there's more of that, okay? So you, you, I use this opportunity to let residents know that, oh, okay, we're, we're not that bad, right? It's like other people do the same as we do. So that's the consensus there. Some attendings who would not brace it, compression fracture, some will do. And, and literally, I always say, how frail is that patient? How morbidly obese? How active are they? And also, what are the circumstances of the uh, trauma, right? It depends on the, uh, I always say the, idiosyncratic of their trauma, where they're doing something that I can't trust them that they wouldn't do again, then they need a brace to remind them of that versus, yes? I mean, if you have, let's say, a slight compression fracture, no pain, you get uprights, and it's like absolute top angles are the same as the CTs, I mean, really, what a brace for that? Like I said, it depends on the idiosyncratic of the injury. So, mm -hmm. you know. I want to remind them that, hey, you're hurt, right? So if you are, if you have three competitions for an ATV mud wheeling and you have a small break, compression fracture and you're okay, I don't want you to go to next week's, right? So I want to put you in a brace so you'll be reminded, right? But, you know, you're on a step ladder, you fell, everything looks good, don't do it again, you're going to work on Monday, you'll be fine, great. So I have this leeway where I say brace for comfort. Right, so I always insist on that. If they're, oh, I don't want to, I say, why don't you have it? Wear it for comfort, right? Yes? Can you talk about handling multiple compression fractures in a row? That depends on exactly how your bone quality looks like on CT, right? You can measure the house per unit very well on CT, and also if you have a known DEXA scan, age, and also um, their propensity to be able to handle it. If they've got multiple uh, compression fractures leading to multiple, uh, leading to a large kyphotic deformity and you're having a lot of back pain, that may not require, or in including that, they also have rib fractures, sternal fractures. That may not be a braceable option. Okay, so that's sort of where I go by. But if they're super frail, um, the brace may hurt them, don't help them. What do you think, David? You don't brace. I, I, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 I,
this is one of my favorite topics because um, some of the things some of the things that I do, I do intentionally to push the envelope because I can get away with things that other people can't get away with. And so my very, very strong bias is to brace nobody, simply to communicate the message and prove the point that you don't have to brace these people. Because the perspective ran to my study. And there we go. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, what did you say? I said the fact that there's a perspective there's a perspective randomized study out there that says the exact same thing is probably you being a, a nomad and leading the group and doing it is probably more important than the that. Yeah, that that and then there are these longitudinal studies out of uh, out of uh, uh, Scandinavia where they've had in essence a socialized health system and a unified medical record dating back to the 1960s that show that the 40 and 50 year outcomes of burst fractures are the same whether you're braced or not braced. Oh, I don't agree with you. I'm just laughing at the narcissistic comment that what you're doing is changing the world. Yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> so I brace um, because I don't want to deal with it, right? I, I, don't, I don't want to deal with, with changing the world through bracing. I want to change it in other ways. Right? See, see, <laughs> see, see right? handed level yeah. one evidence that yeah. says that he doesn't have to do it still doesn't change behavior, Jim. So, so you can have all the level one evidence in the world, but if you have... Precisely, <laughs> right. And then what it does is it gives generation after generation of trainees the option of emerging from their training with, uh, with, with, with the capacity to make a decision for himself or herself about what they think they want to do in their own practices. Within reason with evidence, though. But we have how many, maybe two randomized studies? So, you know. Yeah. It's for comfort. It's for comfort to acknowledge your injury. Okay, bracing does nothing. Sorry. Level one evidence says that it, that, uh, that it makes no difference. And Jim, what do you do in your practice? You do half and half. Yeah. It's for comfort. All right, so. Because of the narcissism. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me get my talk back, so. <laughs> Right. So he does half and half out of out of personal self-interest to avoid dealing with a lawyer. Okay. <laughs> Evidence be damned. Well, he knows where he practices, so that's good. All right. So stable burst fractures. The majority get braced. It's moving away, right? So the majority get braced. They're, they have a lot of back pain, and if they can tolerate a brace. You know, they, they need to have it, right? If there's very little retropulsion um, and, you know, we have a frank discussion with the patient and say, look, if you work a line or you do something physical, it may not be a good idea, right? But, you know, if you're doing some house chores, et cetera, weekend sports, and you're going to go to an office and you have time off, you know, this is all related to the luxury of what your employer and what your lifestyle is, right? So... You know, you may have to get a brace for a stable fracture. So surgery usually for multi-level or if you have other injuries. Remember, we talked about the qualifiers. So, but on stable burst fracture, typically you're getting surgery, right? So anterior posterior for, or plus or minus posterior for near intact or incomplete, and also for posterior for complete injuries, decompression, stabilizing them. So anybody knows why we'll, we'll, if somebody has a complete injury, we've, they're out of the window of suspicion, et cetera, why we're even, you know, doing surgery? Anybody has a very concise, mind you, there's Jim Harrop and David O'Conquer in the room, so choose your answers. We'll, we'll, I'll yield to my gentleman from McGill. Uh, well, there's compression on the cord, do you want to prevent Delayed syringomyelia, you think that makes a difference? Big difference to evidence that? Raise the level of injury. Raise the level, you, you think there'll be ascending injury, is that what you're trying to say, ascending injury? Okay, all right, Nathan, you're going home with David, so be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna guess that patients start to tight because they lose uh, all of their downward and all the feedback to help and augment them, keep them upright until you want to keep them from hypothesis. So they can, what does that do to them? They, they have no sensation, et cetera. They may have some shock or joint. So 
what's that got to do with anything? Well, I mean, if, you, if you're not going to do anything, then they're going to do crumbling. OK. No? Okay. Yes, sir. Care, right? So they, they, they can sit in a chair. They can mobilize. Um, they don't have pain, literally, from the uh, kyphotic hump. And also it helps with uh, self-care and also rehab. It gives them comfort to get appropriate rehab. Does it make sense? <laughs> and also, these days, there's always the opportunity that they're, they may improve over time, right? Dr. Okonko has a great talk and slide about the number of people that even out of the window of, of quote unquote, where we think is they're complete, there is some improvement. So you want to stabilize them to, to give them all the opportunity that they're small percentage. And, and if you're that small percentage, you're appreciated. That will improve the, the actually how stabilizing can aggressively go on with the uh, therapies. Okay, so. There's no question about flexion, distraction, injuries, and fracture dislocation. They're, they're all just surgery, and it's always the flavor of who you are. And, and I used to have a good mentor who said the best surgery is the one that's the safest in your hands that achieves the same goal, right? So there you go. So non-operative treatment for thoracolumbar fractures. So this involves things that you may not want to deal with, but it might be the right thing. Frequent clinic visits. Close observation is required for if somebody has posterior ligamentous disruption, you really need to follow them closely, two weeks, six weeks, et cetera, right? Even if you're bracing them, okay? It's, it's safe. You know, if they have that with neurological injury, and it could be as simple as uh, urinary issues that partially controlled, they did not want to have surgery, you had a good frank discussion with them, you know? Okay. Particularly those who are morbidly obese will not fit well in the braced. But they're still saying, you know, they have a choice. They, they can say they don't want surgery. It means you have to have more visits to the clinic, okay? And also, if they have multi-system injuries, definitely. You want to also be an advocate for them. So brace or surgery, right? We've established that we're going to do bracing. Neurologically intact patient, less than 40% height loss of that level of injury or you know, if they're together, uh, multiple levels, less than 40% height loss in, in, in series or together. And also they're complying, right? They're, you know, they, they have the education to understand what you're saying. Uh, mentally, they don't have any uh, ongoing active mental issues. Um, and also they're of the age where they can also comply appropriately. And also, like, like I said, body habitus and also the circumstances of the accident. The, I always add my own personal idiot component to the accident. If there's somebody who I'm not sure is going to follow through with anything that I'm saying, even if they don't have any of those criteria, I strongly suggest surgery um, to avoid that. Oh, so less than 10 degrees kyphosis on, on upright imaging. All right, so that's part of non-bracing. So surgical results in thoracic lumbar burst fracture. So, We've moved on from whether to brace or not brace. We're not doing surgery. So there's a tendency for less kyphosis and better pain function with anterior surgery. We're restoring height. We're allowing the posterior ligamentous complex to function and also to help them with their own rotational feedback when you do anterior surgery. But I would say anterior surgery and old people don't mix very well. Longer surgery, potential of um, bone quality um, compromising your, your work. So. You have to say that when you have degenerative changes, you have to always consider anterior and posterior surgery, okay? So there is more instability or deformity or poor bone quality equals failure with short segment. Posterior instrumentation needs more points of fixation and sometimes may require anterior support, all right? Now, these are my bad guys, right? If you want to do posterior surgery for uh, AS, DISH, rheumatoid, metabolic bone disease, osteoporosis, the malnourished, long segments, posterior surgery. Um, never been successful with anterior surgery, never seen any series that short segments for any of these have not, respond, uh, have not resulted into significant complications. Okay, so, so this is a simple case, 30-year-old, back pain, decreased motor sensory function, T12, head, chest, abdomen, pelvis negative. 
what do you think? Um, thoracolumbar pain may have palpable defect, two out of five below iliopsoas. This person needs surgery. There's no question about that, right? There's fragment that's in the canal, um, facet joint widening, very easy, right? You know, the MRI looks bad. You get your telix in, he's definitely in the surgical criteria. So there's no brace, bed rest, et cetera, for him. So that makes it easy. Now, this is a little bit of an unusual case, but it's recent, and I, I kind of think it's interesting. This is a 22-year-old, uh, uh, multiple gunshot wounds, has no anterior column uh, injury, right? It's all posterior uh, and also middle column, right? So he's got some pedicle fracture there. That's where the trajectory of the bullet went. Um, he's got complete injury, okay? Complete injury. What do you think his options are? Should we brace him? Complete injury. Mobilize. Chest tubes. Mobilize. Chest tubes. And mobilize. And mobilize. You wouldn't want to stabilize him for anything. Why not, Dr. Chapman? He's complete. Age of eight. Yes. Motor score of 50. Yes. We talked about, yeah. Uh, do we know the He's very young. There's a chance that he might. Missiles, yeah. Uh, bullet. Yeah. So, Handgun. Handgun, yeah. Mobilize, no brace. No brace. Okay. You worried about him developing a gibbous or a kyphotic no. deformity? Positively there? not. Positively not. Yeah. All right. Well, we didn't mobilize. We didn't do that. We stabilized him. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. No. This is this. Uh, this has more to do with the degree of. Degree of community, community fragments. There's, there's a bunch of literature about this. There's a great study in neurosurgery about 50 years ago during the Iran Iraq War where they looked at the Yeah. There is, I'll say this to remember everyone, there is zero indication to ever operate on a gunshot wound in this fight. To, no, 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 that's not true. No, 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 no. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. That's no, not true. No, 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 no. no, no, so, no that's so, not true. Uh, so th this, uh, this is. That's not true. Yeah. So, so yeah. if no, 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 no. So if you have a bullet in the canal, in the canal. at T12. I have a bullet in the lumbar spine and you have hyperinflammation. That's one reason I'll tell you that one. Okay. So okay. you've already disproved your own point. Okay. <laughs> we can add yeah. to that list. Yeah, we can well, add as many things to yeah, that list. Yeah, as you, give yeah. me a number, Jim, and we'll get to that number. <laughs> In the back of your head, start with, there is never an indication that we can operate on the lumbar. No, in the back of your head, in the back of your head, you should say that, that the Waters and Atkins data shows that if you have a bullet in the canal at T12 or below, there are increased rates of uh, improved neurologic performance at one year with extraction of the bullet from the canal. I'm not buying it. Not buying it. Nope. Okay. That, which is which? That the the Jim Harrop definition of level one evidence is evidence that fits my worldview. Charlie, <laughs> Charlie, you're not gonna go scot free. You, you you actually work in a park center, so so. <laughs> For C spine, for C spine uh, injuries related to gunshot wounds. And uh, we had a few cases where if there was three column disruption, you know, of the facet joints and, you know, uh, a portion of the vertebral body and, and posterior elements, um, you know, those patients who had three column uh, disruption were basically similar to any standard traumatic situation. And those people, uh, you know, with that paradigm that you mentioned, they developed extreme kyphosis and worsening neurological function. So, so let me rechange my paradigm again. <laughs> Are you changing your mind, Jim? There's what? What did you say, Jim, again? I wouldn't operate on the cube. Well, so. Let me ask you this, guys. How's your rate of CSF leak if you cube the operator? It doesn't change. Well, yeah. it depends on where the bullet is, you, yeah. you, you know. So, like, the, some of these patients that I mentioned in the paper are uh, patients who who, uh, who didn't have fragments that were in the canal. Uh, it was just, like, a bony disruption from the uh, the bullet itself. 
um, and the ligamentous disruption is like a shatter injury. Right. Yeah. 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 A different entity, I guess. So, <laughs> good show. So, so I, I think, you know, Dr. Chapman is right. You know, they, they, we talked about caliber, velocity, and, and traumatic damage. To me, it's more of how much commutative fragments are in the canal causing ongoing compression. Now, you probably will, will would you do something different if the patient was uh, not complete? So the T12 below yeah. and the incomplete paradigm uh, yeah. changes things around. Changes That's things. where Good. everything happens. But if this is a motor sensory complete Asia, a yeah. thoracic cord level and a regular uh, handgun type caliber, a low velocity weapon, there's no reason to operate. Mm. Uh, the high velocities do create a very different situation, but the anterior spinal column is completely intact there and the patient will remodel just fine. There's no... So I, I concur. I hate, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to concur with Dr. Hill. I, I cannot say that enough. Jim and I love to disagree. But I think I've served my I purpose. I agree. Listen to this. I agree with Dr. Jim Harrop. It's it's recorded in perpetuity. It might come back and haunt you, Dr. Chapman. He's already on record. It's already it's already on Facebook. Well. <laughs> well, th th this gentleman, like uh, Dr. Chapman had, he needed a chest tube, he needed, uh, uh, he needed an X lap, etc. So I was very concerned. So we, we, did, we did stabilize him. Okay. He, he did well. I know we can, but he did well. <laughs> yeah, he's 22. If, if, if he was older, I wouldn't. He's 22. They, 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 there's an increase in, in, in improvement the younger you are. So I, 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 had to, I got to give him that. Yeah. Well, how do you improve his quality of life? Uh, transfer, the fact that you know, he can participate well, ascending injury. Um, you know, he's been nicely debrided in the area where I'm concerned about. Swelling of the cord, yes. So I give him a chance. He's 22. He, yeah. So would you decompress him? I take some fragments out. Yeah, I think we did that. Yeah. So it's a missing spinous process. I think this is another question of all today. It's important. How is it percent wrong? The neurologic injury from the bullet is typically not fragments unless the bullet does not go through the canal. The velocity of the bullet. Correct. The Correct. Dr. Chapman agrees with that. I agree. We've improved his chances of that not being an issue. No, 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 no. This guy had an X lab before we even got him. It's like, you know, so he's better. They're able to. No. <laughs> I think there's a we're penetrating. Penetrating is an exclusion. But yeah, so so these are. And there is, Vafa from Iran did do a study looking at decompressing your comment earlier. And they found that the thoracic spinal cord injury was decompressing or not in Asia Ace. These are just for the record. What's up? Let's say these are Uh oh, here he comes. And there was, what? Say it. So Here it comes. Yeah. So, so there's just, 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 just comes. that we're just that we're clear. There's a little bit. There's a difference between um, the, the case that Kojo is showing now and the broader discussion. And and Jens pointed uh, pointed to this as well. So T12 and below oh. is a different conversation from a thoracic injury. No, I'll reference the more definitive paper of Waters and Atkins from 1976 where there's superior motor recovery at one year in people who have a bullet fragment in the canal at T12 to L4. Right. So I'm just saying, I'm just making sure that we're all that that everybody in the room understands that, that we're talking that that there's a difference between the broader conversation of penetrating spinal cord injury and the specific case that that Dr. Hamilton is showing here. So you don't want to just take the dogma, don't operate on people with 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 penetrating TB uh, with penetrating SCI because there is a distinction to be made 
between people whose injury is at the conus or below versus people whose injuries are in the, the cervical or thoracic spinal cord. Great. Great. No, 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 no. That is that paper is the uh, the paper that I'm referring to is the spinal cord injury model system database. So it's a it's a national multi center. They're gonna beat them to death, Dr. Chapman. <laughs> Uh, they were, these are not patients from a single institution. This is the National Spinal Cord Injury Model Systems Database. Don't forget the paper from Iran. <laughs> so now we have complications from, from what we did, right? Infections, implant failures, adjacent level disease, iatrogenic injury, of course, right? You're stabilizing somebody, you slip. It's on the back of your sweatshirt, two hands, and also lawsuits, right? Uh, so not interrupting with it, but if you've seen one lawsuit, you've only seen one lawsuit. So it's a whole different course, okay? They come with the turf. They're, 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 you deal with people who have an, a grievance settlement. It comes with it. So, all right, conclusions. So you need a uniform language for the mechanism of injury, right? You have to have a plan to stick with it, but you have to have a backup for the unexpected. <laughs> You know, you go in there, you know, nerve roots flying. You understand that you're not in the situation where you need to be. You need to not savor the case. You know, you need to pack up. And also, um, you need to have an excellent trauma service. You, you know, no, uh, no woman or man is an island. So you need to have an excellent trauma service. And also, be careful how the misfortune can impact you. Um, it doesn't end there. There's ongoing sequela, et cetera. Um, there. Okay? I think we've had a good discussion about this. <laughs> <laughs>